Expert insights with Leadium, where busy leaders learn. Work design has really come to the fore because people are having to ask questions like, well, okay, how are we going to work from home? How are they going to coordinate their activities with their other teammates? And now in some places where most of us are sort of back at work in the office, now there are questions like, how do we preserve some of the benefits of working from home versus, you know, how do we not have everybody just stay home now all the time because that's the habit everyone's got into and then losing some of the benefits of coming into the office. This old fashioned notion of working nine to five, which is somewhat of a historical artifact, you know, people are now going, oh, well, actually, we can question th these things. So it's really got people thinking about different ways of getting the, the job done. Welcome to this episode of the Leadium Podcasts. I'm Sharon Longridge, and I'm delighted that you're joining this conversation about smarter ways of getting the job done through the application of skillful work design. Most of us spend one third of our life working. When our job is enjoyable and satisfying, it positively impacts our motivation, performance, self-esteem and psychological health. Everyone is the beneficiary. So let's bring some science to the fore so that we can craft roles that build job satisfaction, employee commitment and enhanced well-being. A moment ago, you heard from our esteemed guest, Dr. Sharon Parker. For decades, Sharon has been firmly focused on making our working life more positive and productive. She is the director of the Center for Transformative Work Design at Curtin University, where she's also a professor of organizational behavior in the Faculty of Business and Law. An Australian Research Council Laureate Fellow, Sharon's research areas include job and work design and employee performance and development. She has published more than 100 internationally referred articles, including publications in top tier journals. In 2019, Sharon was recognized as one of the world's most influential social scientists by the Web of Science group. Dr. Parker's team has developed the SMART job design model. SMART stands for stimulating, mastery, agency, relational, and tolerable. Sharon will share more about that soon. But before we leap in, I invite you to briefly reflect on the following questions. A quick yes or no will do for now. Do you use a variety of different skills and abilities to complete your work? Are you clear on what you do and why? Do you control the timing and scheduling of your tasks? And do you feel valued and are your colleagues supportive? And finally, is your workload manageable? If you didn't answer yes to all of those questions, there could well be scope to improve your job design. The pandemic-induced shake-up of 2020 has forced many organisations to redesign working life. This challenge includes a powerful opportunity to advance how we work, how we lead, and how we optimise the roles that our people fulfil. So work has really changed during this time for many people. It's actually brought work to the surface. I think we just do our work and we sometimes don't think about it. We don't reflect very much on it, even though it has a very profound impact on our life. When something changes, then suddenly it gets into your consciousness much more clearly. So because work has changed and people have been working from home, people having to very rapidly adapt and there's been a lot of adaptivity and proactivity and got people to reflect on work and what makes work positive. I'd like to touch on an article that you co-wrote and published in the Harvard Business Review recently mm -hmm. titled Remote Managers Are Having Trust Issues. It was a great headline. And it was based on recent research that you and your team conducted that the essence of it was that the COVID pandemic thrust leaders into remote management with no warning and in many instances very little training. Can you just share some details around the scope of the study but also the key findings? This was the working from home study and we we had more than a thousand people from all over the world. It was a fairly educated sample who participated in the in the study and this is where we've now been tracking how they are going over time. But in those early days, people say, you know, it wasn't so much working from home, but it was, you know, people at home trying to do their work during a pandemic. And what we found in that research was that there were a reasonably large number of managers that was more than 25 percent 
you know, that were really not trusting their workers and therefore engaging in well, two sorts of behaviours. And one of them was sort of a micromanagement behaviour, checking up on people, making sure that they were working, not really believing that they were working and so on. And the second behaviour they engaged in was this expectation that the person should be available at all times. And this really is a phenomenon that's emerged around mobile phones because people can do their work anywhere, anytime. There's a temptation for managers to expect them to do their work anywhere, anytime. And during the pandemic, because the pressure was on, we saw that accentuated. We had a, a large number of people in the sample um, and saying, I'm expected to respond immediately and I'm expected to respond at night. And if I don't respond at night or immediately, my manager thinks I'm not working and is, is not positive. I actually wrote a, a blog about it at the time called Tethered or Trusted. You know, are you tethered to the desk, sort of psychologically have to stay there? Or are you actually trusted, given a little bit of latitude, but it's understood that you're going to do the work? And managers need to learn to trust people. And part of that is about learning to manage people by outputs rather than inputs. When you're sitting near someone and you can see that the person's there, there's an assumption that they're working. But when you can't see them, how do you know if they're working? Well, the only way you can really know is by the quality and the quantity of the work that they produce in the end of the day. And that's a shift that managers have made even in the office. Not all, but, but some. And it's because we've got this growing amount of knowledge work in the world. And as you know, knowledge work is something that you do in your head. So in the end, you sort of have to trust that knowledge workers are doing their work because you can't really see them doing it. And knowledge workers are best managed by looking at, well, have they delivered what it was that we wanted them to deliver? But unfortunately, as we talked about in that article, not every manager had time to acquire that skill. And that was then causing some pressure for the people on the receiving end of that management behaviour. We found that it was contributing to their distress. It was causing homework conflict because of this sense that you couldn't be flexible. And it was actually also negatively associated with performance because there's a sort of perverse thing you think that by monitoring someone, you're helping their performance, but actually mostly you're just demotivating them and telling them you don't trust them, which is usually not a great state of mind for you to produce your best work. We know that trust is a key ingredient in psychological safety, and we know that psychological safety is one of the critical ingredients in high-performing effective teams. And yet what your study also pointed to was that we can have a dis trust contagion and that if you've got a low trust boss the probability is that you're going to be less trusting of your direct reports so it sounds like there's a there's a negative spiral what did you capture were the effects of that was this the lower rates of performance was that the outcome that was interesting that the people who themselves were managed through a sort of micromanagement type of approach were more likely to engage in that behavior to their people that they managed. And it could be a trust contagion sort of effect. It could also be a sort of social learning process where in a sense you learn how to manage by observing your own managers, but probably both of those I think are important. That sort of makes it even more challenging because it's not like those managers can then ask for help from their bosses. So in a sense, they end up just passing on the pain to the, the sort of lowest level in the in the organisation. One of the recommendations we made in that article was to start from the top. If you're going to invest in developing that skill of managing people when you don't have line of sight, you know, start at the highest level and then trickle down because it's going to be very hard if you're trying to get, you know, the lowest level supervisors to do it, but their managers are not doing it. That was one of the findings from the study. You pointed to the challenge that leaders face when they're managing remote teams, and that is striking this balance between autonomy and accountability. And your broader work talks to the fact that remote working can actually really deliver in terms of productivity and I'm sure satisfaction levels and engagement levels, but it's about doing it well. 
Can you just bullet point a few insights that you, you have around what effective remote working really does look like? We did this research during the pandemic because normally, you know, people would work from home flexibly when they want to, it's their preference and when their manager trusts them and so on. And yet during the pandemic, of course, it's been very different. Lots of people have been working at home, irrespective of preference, irrespective of whether they're set up, irrespective of whether their manager trusts them. So it really did warrant um, a, a new look at the topic. A meta-analysis, for example, was conducted and I think there were 46 different research studies in that meta-analysis. And actually, uh, that showed that on average, people who work from home are higher performers, are more satisfied, have less homework conflict, and are more engaged with their work. And the main reason for that is because they have more autonomy in their work. So there are people who were trusted to work from home and they were given some autonomy, and then they perform better and they thrive more in their work. There is some evidence that um, too much working from home is not necessarily positive, but some amount of working from home seemed overall to have real benefits. We need to be careful to try to preserve some of this learning into the future because there is a real gain to be had if we can get the remote working right in terms of people being able to better juggle, you know, all the different demands in their lives and just have that little bit of flexibility. Probably the biggest challenge to remote work, and this is why I would also argue we shouldn't be going completely remote, actually isn't so much the accountability. So you sort of mentioned this autonomy accountability trade-off. It's actually more around the relational aspects of work. Nothing really replaces face-to-face -face connection for interpersonally difficult situations for complex collaborative problem solving and innovation where you've got teams of people that have got to come together and spark ideas where you've got difficult situations like dealing with a performance issue or something that's interpersonally complex the research shows that it's best to do those things face to face one of the tensions that we've got to juggle when we're thinking about how much remote work is ideal is we want to be sure not to lose some of those relational aspects of work. And that requires some face-to-face -face time. We've heard these sort of companies announce, you know, oh, we're going to go completely office free. You know, we've discovered people can do it. There's a danger with that. One is that you miss out on this informal connections and relational side of things. Another danger is that Pre-pandemic, most people had been working face-to-face -face, and so they built up strong trust with their peers and connection. And we were sort of living off that, right, during COVID. So in part, many of the teams that were successful, they were capitalising on the fact that they already knew each other well. If we move to a completely remote sort of situation, I think that we will lose some of those connections that people get through that face-to-face and informal connection that you get in a workplace. How do you keep people connecting with each other, especially when they do that more interdependent work, like teamwork, where what you do affects someone else? You know, it's really important to focus on that as part of the equation. Sharon, it sounds like you're talking about this invisible currency in any effective workplace, which is the social capital. You know, that really helps us to problem solve, helps us to come together, creates that culture of, of supportiveness. And, and again, when you're, when you're in the room with someone, that, that flows very readily, whereas the remote communication is much more contrived. All that spontaneity is gone. And there's a phrase that you used that I thought was really very insightful. And we want to check in rather than check up. And when mm. I really thought about that, I went, that's very nuanced communication. Like we're really requiring our leaders and our managers to be, you know, very kind of emotionally attuned to get the, the tone, conversational tone right to, to walk that balance. I, I think there's a couple of things there. One of my blogs was, was about being a Zoom zombie. And that was about, you know, how if you do too many Zoom calls, in a day, you know, it's just exhausting because you have to compensate for the fact that you can't see the whole body and you're not sure where, whether you're giving them eye contact. There's all sorts of things that actually make 
that screen conversation both more challenging and more exhausting. Sometimes it's even nice to turn off the uh, camera and just listen, just do audio, you know, just to give yourself a break. That highlights on the other side of the coin, the importance of face-to-face communication. And, And in the light of people feeling isolated, potentially, you know, I know, for example, we have lots of staff members who are you know, they're not in relationships, they're on their own and things, you know, it really, really had to give serious attention to this checking in. How is this person going? We would always start every meeting with just a quick, you know, check-in. And I'm sure many managers did of individual conversations, because as you said, right at the outset of the conversation, Sharon, people's experiences were very, very, very different. Some people going crazy with you know, small children and a husband who wouldn't do anything. On the other hand, you have people thriving, loving it, you know, um, just relishing in the freedom. It's really important that the managers in terms of their, their social capital to connect in with people, check in on how that individual was doing. And in fact, one of the findings from our study was that the level of psychological distress in the sample was at least twice as high as it normally is. And we already know, even pre-COVID, we had a mental health crisis in Australia. Uh, One in five Australians, you know, at any one time experiencing mental health issues. And then we're talking about that doubling, at least during the pandemic. So part of what managers really needed to do was that check-in and give people some support. And and this remains the same as we reintegrate back into workplaces or adopt hybrid models. So let's just focus in on on this psychological distress my company Ledium we ran a survey as well of leaders and the Mm. the the key finding was that leaders primary concern for the majority of the respondents was the wellness and 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 health and stress levels of their team followed by their own Mm. so this really is a, a big alarm bell and I just want to just segue into some of the work that you've done around overwhelm and burnout and and what skillful workplace design can do to mitigate this Mm. risk? I just want to echo the fact that it wasn't just the workers who were suffering, it was the managers, because, you know, it's always the way, isn't it? The managers are in the middle and they're both trying to execute and, and get work done, but also you know, having to take responsibility for people. And I, and I think, again, often in a way in which they were not equipped, particularly while we're doing a lot of broader research on, on mental health in the workplace, and it, it, it's certainly becoming a big issue. In terms of, from a work design perspective, we have a, this smart model of work design, and the T in the smart model is, is for tolerable. And so what we talk about is the importance of people having demands in their work, that are tolerable. And that means um, that they are able to manage them and that the demands do not exceed the personal resources that the person has for dealing with them. The tricky thing about this, and it's something that people struggle with, is people what people can tolerate is different. One person is going to thrive on working flat out nine hours a day and another person it's going to break. It's different to physical risks in the workplace. I always give the example of if a brick falls on your head, it's going to really, really hurt your head. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter what your personality is. Doesn't matter what your life circumstances is. But if you've got really high level of workload, the impact is going to be very different according to you as a person. Also according to, and this is where the work design comes in, according to the other aspects of the smart work design model. So with work demands, we obviously, ideally, you would like to reduce those demands. So if someone is working really long hours or has a lot of emotional pressure or, you know, is doing work and perhaps exposed to trauma or something, ideally, we like to reduce those demands. Sometimes it's not possible to reduce the demands. So if you think about the job of a paramedic, for example, they're going to be exposed to horrific situations that are very emotionally demanding that is the nature of the job so what we also have to do is think about how do we support people to manage those demands and if we do that we actually can make the demands more tolerable 
if I go to the rest of the SMART model, um, the first is for stimulating work. If people have a bit of variety and they're doing different things, then that can help them to manage demands better. Um, mastery is about clarity and feedback. So if you're clear what it is that you're meant to be doing and you're getting feedback on how well you're doing it, that enables you to do your task well. And one of the big contributors to stress that we see is when people don't know what it is they're meant to be doing. And somehow, you know, they've got a manager who's maybe micromanaging and putting pressure on them, but they don't really know what it is they're meant to be doing. So we need to make sure people are clear about their responsibilities. And then A is for agency, and that's about having some autonomy. So being clear doesn't mean spelling out in great detail the precise things that every single person needs to do at every single second, because that would be sort of micromanagement. Being clear is about being clear about what the roles and responsibilities are. And then you want to give people some agency to actually achieve those responsibilities. And autonomy is really, really important. And so, you know, going back to the paramedic example, let's say they have experienced a really difficult demand, uh, a traumatic situation. Do they have some autonomy to be able to say, look, I need a break before I go out again? Or are they just sent straight out because there's some ridiculous KPI of ambulance use? And this unfortunately does sometimes happen. They have the autonomy to, you know, go home a little bit early if it's been a particularly tough day. So autonomy can really help make those demands more manageable. And then the last element of the model before the T is, is R for relational. And, and here is where support makes a huge difference. And we saw this during the pandemic. And that's what we were talking about with the check-in versus check-up. Check-in is providing support and, and saying, are you okay? And can I help you? And have you got what you need? And people are able to actually cope with much higher levels of demand and experience them as tolerable if they've got support. So when, we, when we're trying to think about designing work to make sure that it's tolerable, yes, one strategy is to reduce the demands, but the other equally important strategy is to say, well, have people got the autonomy? Have they got the support? Have they got the clarity? And those things are really important to ensure that the demands remain tolerable. Expert Insights with Ledium, where busy leaders learn. Everything you say makes perfect sense to me uh, as someone who is deeply invested in, in health and productivity in the workplace. So if organisations are to really adopt and own this model, what does that look like? We're getting a lot of interest in the SMART model and some of the interest is coming from a mental health perspective because actually if you create smart work with those five elements, you are also simultaneously tackling some of the big psychosocial risks. And that's the language that's used from a sort of mental health perspective that work not only has these physical risks, but it has these psychological risks that you need to prevent. For example, one psychosocial risk is lack of control. Well, agency is all about giving people control. The other side of the equation that is a little bit more around the future of work, absolutely we're going to see the acceleration of digitalization coming out of COVID. And companies have to think about things like if I do have a robot or if I have an algorithm or a machine, who's going to make that decision, the, the machine or the human? And so all these questions are surfacing about how we're going to actually design work given the rapid acceleration of AI and algorithms and robots in the workplace. So we would always start with a diagnosis of, of how smart is people's work design according to the people who do the work. If, for example, there's a concern about absenteeism and mental health or workers' compensation claims, then we'll, we'll try and collect data on all those things and we will link it to smart. So we will ask the question, well, what is it that seems to be causing absence or causing workers' compensation claims. And, you know, often it is these excessive demands, for example, but sometimes it's also low autonomy. So we do all that sort of diagnosis and analysis, and that's really important. And then one would go on to try to redesign the work. And, and Sharon, that's why I really am passionate about this topic and have sort of loved it and investigated it for so many years. 
because you can change the work. You know, if you do research on personality or something like that, I always find that a bit frustrating because, you know, unless someone goes to therapy for 15 years, you can't really change your personality that much. But work, we can change. And so to me, that's a really exciting thing then is working with an organisation to say, okay, how can we do this better? The potential is usually there with some creativity to find better ways of doing the work. I'd like just to loop back to this conversation around psychological wellness and creating the settings for people to stay well. And I often use the word, you know, manage their mental capital and their mental stamina, particularly for knowledge workers. There's some very interesting science about the power of micro breaks. If you're in a high demand workplace and due to the relentless nature of the stressors, like your paramedics, probably a reasonably good example of that, you know, there's not the, the recovery time for the nervous system. And, and, you know, obviously this is costly in terms of stress baseline and coping skills. And we can intercept that by engineering into the workflow conscious breaks, relaxation breaks, and science supports the notion that if you meditate or do mindfulness practices in those breaks, you're going to calm the nervous system. And, and if this is implemented and regular over time, you will actually get stress baseline down. What's mm-hmm. your view through your lens on this notion of replenishing micro breaks? Yeah, I, and you're absolutely right. There is evidence about that. And and uh, again, that was another one of the topics that I covered during COVID because one of the things that happens is, you know, and going back to that heterogeneity of experience, some people were just working all the time. You know, So some people were struggling to get their work done because of small children or self-discipline issues or whatever. But some people, on the other hand, were just working too much micro bakes is really important. I think one thing that's important is giving people some autonomy over them. So I do know of organizations that have, you know, have a forced system where literally your computer goes off or something after 20 minutes and tells you to have a micro break. The intention is good, but the execution is not so good because people have got to choose to have the breaks when it's going to best suit them. And also people should choose what sort of break they want. Some people are going to love having a little bit of a five minute meditation. Other people would be much better off, you know, just walking outside for five minutes in the sunshine. It's really important that people do that, but they should be able to figure out the best way to do it themselves. There's also a lot of research on recovery. It is important for people to think about How do you recover from work? And part of it is about detachment. You know, when you go home, actually not even just not working, but not thinking about work too. So really detaching. And that's harder than ever when we've got mobile phones and laptops. Research actually shows one of the best ways to facilitate recovery is to have people engage in what what we call mastery sorts of tasks, hobbies or activities where you're learning a new skill. So whether it's going to tennis and, you know, trying to improve your forehand or whether it's taking a, you know, guitar lesson or or even just doing some craft, but where you're learning and you're active, research shows that that actually can facilitate more detachment and have positive effects that are actually even greater than just sort of relaxing and sitting in front of the TV, for example. So one of our studies showed that people are more proactive if the next day in their work, if they engage in this sort of mastery recovery activities in the evening where they're, where they're doing something which is, which is stretching them a little bit, but not work, not in the work domain, in another domain. So I think the micro breaks is a, is a great strategy and also thinking about that recovery and how you do it when you get home, you know, sitting in front of the TV and having, you know, five glasses of wine every night, tempting though that is, probably is not the best uh, <laughs> recovery strategy. Now, notwithstanding the, the genuine suffering and pain that this pandemic has caused, you know, I'd like to think that it's also going to bring us opportunity and we need to seize it and find it and run with it. And, and I'm interested in your lens on that. What do you feel are the opportunities for more enlightened workplaces and leaders right now in terms of, you know, ushering their workforce into this next era of working? Definitely there's more interest in working from home. The sort of um, broader picture there is a recognition of, of that you can trust people and that they can be productive even if you can't see them. 
So I'm really optimistic that we can create more agency in our work because that's been a challenge historically. It's hard for people to let go of power and control, especially if they feel they're being held accountable. It's very hard for people to trust that their employees will deliver. And yet all the research evidence shows that that's when you get people who perform, who are creative, who are innovative, who have good mental health, who want to stay with the organisation. It's also thinking a little bit about what is the office. When we all came back to, to the office, first of all, you have to deal with the fact that we're out of the habit of not coming into work. But the other thing that was interesting was that some people just were straight back. They were like desperate to be back. And then there were other people who didn't really want to come back. And some even now who haven't really come back. And the tricky situation that it created for us is that the people that were back, they wanted social connection and they wanted to be with people and they wanted that social capital you were talking about earlier, Sharon. And yet then there was hardly anyone there. So then they start saying, oh, well, what's the point of coming in? And then before you know it, you can actually get this sort of contagion effect where no one is really coming in. I was worried about this. I actually found a research article which showed exactly this phenomenon that unless you get a sort of critical mass of people in the office, other people won't come in and then you can create a situation of remote working contagion. Then you lose those real benefits of what the office can deliver. It's an opportunity to create a work environment that people want to come to. We've had years and years of open spaced offices, which people hate, which many companies have introduced. They could see that cost opportunities, but all the research evidence in the world shows that it doesn't work. It doesn't facilitate innovation. Most people would prefer to have an office or some space that they can call their own. So let's have a think about what is a good office? What is going to motivate people to come back? And maybe an open space office is not the way to go. Companies could look at the evidence and learn from it. And what's really important is the quality of people's work and the leadership of, the, of that work. You know, so it come, what's really important is the smart work design, whether you're at home, whether you're in the office. That's what's really important for creating innovation and culture and good vibe and good old-fashioned management, you know, leadership. That's what's really important. Klaus Schwab from the World Economic Forum said recently, how companies behave today will shape the way they are perceived long after the crisis. Now, if you were a CEO re-engineering your workforce for a post-COVID world, what would be your preoccupations right now? How an organisation behaves during crisis is a very strong indicator of their real values. And in fact, that was one of the observations that came out of our conversation with the entrepreneurs, that the entrepreneurs that had really invested in the people side of their business before COVID talked about how they were really reaping the benefits of it because people were willing to give their all and they were willing to really adapt and put in the hours and do what it took in order to be successful in a radically different world. And that stemmed from people's loyalty and commitment that had come from people's pre-COVID behaviour. We really invest in genuinely treating people well in the workplace and creating meaningful work for them to do where they've got that variety and agency and they've got demands that are tolerable then we are actually setting up a workforce that is going to be able and willing to give their all. Or if we have the second or third wave, I think it's about looking after people in the end. If you really boil it down, it's about wanting to treat people well. And, and part of that is about how you manage them, the quality of the work that they do. And that's within your control as a CEO. You, you might not be able to control what the new challenge is that's on the horizon, but creating a workforce, doing meaningful good work is within your control. And what about the capability and mindset of the leaders? Well, what do you feel those leaders really need to be demonstrating? I'm talking about respect for people coupled with commitment to high productivity and high performance. Sometimes people think when you talk about 
caring for people and creating good work that you know you just want to live in this soft fluffy la la land and people just do what they like and turn that's not what we're talking about here because we're talking about people being accountable and working hard and being productive and giving their all but we're talking about it, them doing it in a context where they feel respected and cared for and valued that's the holy grail timely insights and practical approaches to designing much smarter jobs with Dr. Sharon Parker, Director of the Centre for Transformative Work Design at Curtin University. If you enjoyed this conversation, please subscribe to the program and leave a review if you found this episode interesting. To elevate your leadership, please join the conversation at leadium.com.au. And in our next Leadium podcast, you'll learn how to future-proof your career and thrive in the fourth industrial revolution as we unpack the changing nature of work and the critical skill sets going forward with Dr. Ben Heimer, the Director of the Future of Work from PwC.